Vedanta makes a clear distinction between understanding and knowledge. And because we are going to use many terms, define them and understand them, it is almost technical in nature. Uh, it might be advisable to just keep noting down a few things. So there is a clear distinction between knowledge and understanding. You may make two columns in the form of a table, just two columns. In the first column, the heading could be understanding, the second column, the understanding could be knowledge. Understanding is denoted by Vidya and knowledge is denoted by Avidya. We need to get a hold on these terms before we can proceed to explore the meaning of the verses. Hmm? So the first column is headed as understanding. We can write Vidya there. The next word that is applicable to the first column is both. And to the second column, the corresponding word would be Gyan. Next to both, you could also write Pragyan. Pragyan. Both is under understanding. Both is under understanding. Pragyan too is under understanding. Pragyan. Next word to be included in the first column would be meditative <coughs> understanding, meditative knowing rather, meditative knowing, meditative knowing. In the second column, the corresponding word would be Knowing through external sources. Knowing through external sources. The first column, next word would be reasonless and needless. Reasonless and needless. The second column, the corresponding words would be reasonable and utilitarian. Reasonable and utilitarian. First column, non-material. Second column, material. Hmm? First column, truth. Second column, facts. Facts. First column, Love and freedom. Second column, attraction, benefit and conditioning. 
attraction, benefit and conditioning. First column, aloneness. What is that, sir? Aloneness. 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 Second column, <coughs> perception of the other. Perception of the other. of the other. Alright? First column, Paravidya. 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 Second column, Aparavidya. A para vidya. Hmm? First column Life and Living. Life and Living. Second column Livelihood. Livelihood. First column, heart. Second column, mind. So, Vedant says that only meditative understanding which does not come from any external source is Vidya. Knowledge that is collected from the world through books or through other sources is called by the name Avidya. Whenever there is knowledge, knowledge about anything, knowledge always has an object. So, knowledge with respect to any object, Vedant gives it the name of Avidya. Vidya is simple, needless, silent understanding that arises when one is peaceful. It is not based on information data or knowledge gathered from anybody through any sources. Right? Does that mean that these ancient wise men had totally denied the need for knowledge? Does it mean that they had said that information is of no use? Well, not really. We have come to the point where we can now look at the sheet, the first three verses from Ishupanishad. Ishopanishad 
verse number 9. The first line says that those who worship Avidya enter a deep darkness. Those who live on basis of knowledge gathered from others, any kind of knowledge because all knowledge comes only from others, is dependent on others in some way or the other. So the sage here is saying that deep darkness awaits those who worship knowledge. Hmm? It is almost on predictable lines. Because given that it's a sage talking, we expect that he would be valuing meditative understanding more than knowledge. So when he says that if you worship knowledge, then you are going into darkness. It is on predictable lines. What does it mean to worship knowledge? It means giving importance to knowledge. It means holding knowledge above everything else. Making your decisions based on knowledge, valuing a person based on knowledge. The sage is saying if you do that, then you will enter deep darkness. But a surprise awaits us in the very next line. There the sage says that those who worship meditative understanding, they enter into a darkness yet deeper. So you worship knowledge, you are a worldly man, a pure academician, a scholar who eats, breathes knowledge, then you are entering darkness. But if you have totally ignored the world and are living in your own concepts of meditation, then your situation is even worse. Then you are entering into darkness yet deeper. In the next verse, the sage is telling us that the fruits of Vidya and Avidya are different. Verse number 10, Ishupanishad, they are telling us that the fruits of Vidya and Avidya are different. And in the verse number 11, the story is completed by saying that those who know Vidya and Avidya together, cross death through Avidya and reach immortality through Vidya. These three verses combined leave us with a lot of questions. Firstly, if meditative understanding is so important, then why is the sage saying that those who worship Vidya enter into a darkness deeper than that in which the worshippers of Avidya are placed. Hmm? Second, what are these different fruits of Vidya and Avidya? 
And third, what is meant by knowing Vidya and Avidya together? And finally, as teachers, what is the implication for us? As teachers, are we dispensers of knowledge? Are we dealing with something higher than that? What is meant by taking both together, the heart and the mind? The sage is saying, that if all that you are giving to your students is just knowledge, then please remember that knowledge and the comprehension of knowledge are just memory. And the proof of that is that without memory there can be no knowledge. Then all that we are dealing with is a machine and we are loading the machine with data. This obviously cannot be a task of a very high order. The wise men are decrying that. They are saying it doesn't mean much. At the same time, the wise men are denouncing the so-called spiritual teachers all the more. They are saying that if you are filling the minds of your students with concepts about otherworldliness, with concepts about the beyond, the transcendental, then it is an even greater mistake, an even greater crime. So the sage is saying that both of these are at fault. The so-called academic teacher who dispenses only knowledge and the so-called spiritual teacher who keeps selling dreams of the afterworld. And among these two, the sage is saying, the spiritual teacher is the bigger culprit. Hmm? Why is he saying that? The sage is saying that to be a teacher actually means that you are able to take the student back to himself, not pull the student away from himself. And it doesn't matter what you are teaching. You might be a teacher of medicine, of law, of management, of engineering. It doesn't matter. But as a teacher, the first role, the first responsibility is to ensure the awakening of the student's intelligence. This awakening of student's intelligence is Vidya. Remember, awakening of student's intelligence is not at all the same as loading his mind with knowledge. Rather, it is about awakening that capacity within him, which will help him understand on his own. It is about bringing him to a point where he has all the knowledge to deal with the world 
and yet is not dependent upon his knowledge. He has an identity separate from his knowledge and free of his knowledge. He is not somebody who will collapse if his degrees and qualifications are taken away. He can live even without what the world has given him. When you can live without what the world has given you, then your relationship with world and that includes your job, your career, your family, everything. Then your relationship with the world is of harmony. Not of dependence, not of slavery. These two have to go together. A harmonious relationship with the world and that means other people, surroundings, systems, workplace, colleagues, friends, environment, animals, rivers and mountains, everything and everybody, a harmonious relationship with them where you are neither threatened by them nor do you exploit them. You are neither threatened by them nor do you exploit them. On the outside, a harmonious relationship. On the inside, a deep sense of sureness. which comes from not being dependent on the outside. Not being dependent on the outside. The sage says that merely giving him knowledge is like pushing him into darkness. A teaching institution, a university that gives its students only knowledge is in the eyes of Vedanta not really doing a service to its students. But if these two can be given together, Vidya and Avidya, then the student is redeemed from all his great fears. In verse 11, when the sage says that he overcomes death with Vidya and Avidya together, the student overcomes death. What is meant is that he overcomes the fear of death. Fear happens to be our greatest motivator. To overcome the fear of death means to overcome the biggest fear that we have. If biggest fear is gone, then all other fears are obviously gone. So with Vidya and Avidya together, one can live a life free of fear. Then the mind is not distorted. Then the mind is not under pressure. Then the mind is not afraid all the time. All the subsequent verses that are there are an exposition of this central theme. They will be elaborations of this central theme. But we can proceed to them only after we are sure that we are one with what the wise men had to say. So let's first have an interaction on what has been said so far and if we are one with that then we will proceed to the other verses. Yes please. Yes please. For my ignorance, you said heart and mind. Heart. Yes. There are three things, the body, nerve to leave it away, hmm? but there is a mind and soul. Some people call mind and brain. Mind is? Brain, which is memory, logic, everything, like the mind. The interaction between the mind and the soul and the contribution thereof is a big way. People like us, we know very little, we know a lot. Between the mind and the soul, who helps each other, who controls each other, 
who oversee each other. What we are referring to as the soul, what is commonly referred to as the soul, is exactly what Vedant calls as Hridayam or Atma or Satya. So the soul and the heart are one and the same thing. When you say brain, you are referring to something physical. When you say mind, you are referring to the entire process of happening. Whatever is happening is the mind. That's how mind has been technically defined. Whatever is happening is mind. Hmm? Mind is the set of all that appears to be and appears to happen. Hmm? Heart is when the mind falls silent. A lot appears to happen, that is agitation of the mind, a kind of corruption, a kind of conditioning. When the mind falls silent, when the mind is pure, that itself is called as the heart. You can also call it the soul. You can also call it the soul. Who is performing? Who is doing? Who the doer? Mind? The mind, always. Doership always vests in the mind. At the same time, doership is an illusion because the mind itself is illusory. Reason being, Vedanta takes only the heart to be the truth. Hridayam and Satya are one. Only the heart is the truth. The rest is all just appearances. Just appearances. Yes. How does it relate to what we are doing? That probably is what would interest us more. So what is heart? Clean mind. Clean mind. Emotions are not heart? No, not at all. Emotions are contamination of the mind. You have thoughts, when thoughts become so intense that even the body gets involved, when thoughts start deriving their energy from the deep tendencies, vrittis of the mind, then what you have is emotions. You are just mildly irritated. You would call it a thought. Hmm? Thought. You are thinking about something and the thought is not pleasant. It still classifies just as a thought. But if the intensity of this thought of irritation increases, then this thought will start showing its effects upon the body. The hands may start shivering. The face may flush up with blood, then you call it as an emotion. So, emotion is just intense thoughts. So, what are feelings? Same. So, my feelings for my mother, how are they negative? Why should they be negative? Yes, Considered yes. negative? If you see, you no, know, whatever is positive and negative is just the mind. In the heart, there is nothing positive and nothing negative. Heart is pure emptiness. You see, in the table that you made, you wrote love at one place and corresponding to love, you wrote attraction in the other column. The mind knows only attraction. Hmm? Love is known only to the heart and love is not a feeling. Love is not a feeling. If it is a feeling, it is something of the mind. Some kind of calculation is involved there, some kind of identity and attachment is involved there. It cannot hence, in Vedantic parlance, be called love. Vidhant makes a very clear distinction between Prem and Moh. 
what we usually refer to as prem is merely more. Love really is extremely sublime, very innocent, not at all a matter of labels, relationships or identities. But our love is always dependent on something and wherever there is dependency, there is mind. It would either be dependent on a blood relationship or it would be dependent upon gender or it would be dependent upon looks and economic condition or it would be dependent upon some other factor. And if that factor disappears, our love also stands to reduce. Hence, Vedant does not call the so-called worldly love as love at all. It just calls it attraction and attachment. Mo, asakti, not prem. No, it is not at all subjective. In fact, love is the disappearance of the subject. Whatever is subjective is mind. Mind is the great dualistic distinction between the subject and the object. Whatever is subjective is mind. Subjective means you stand. Subjective means, of course, wherever there is a subjective experience, there will be a subject, right? And the subject is you. The Vedant says that this you that experiences all subjective phenomena is just the ego. The real I sits in the heart and that is not a subject because it does not have a boundary. Subject means there has to be a boundary between the subject and the object. A dividing line. And that dividing line is ego. Here am I and there is the subject. There is the object. So there has to be somebody to define, right? not a matter of what kind of a physical world or mental world you are seeing. As long as there is a world, there is mind because there is no world anywhere except in the mind. So one may see a highly corrupted world, the other may be very positive about the world and hopeful about the world and we may all have our subjective experiences and opinions about the world but as long as this experiencer is there irrespective of what he thinks about the world and what he perceives the world to be it is all just mental the quality of the mind will be different yes of course the quality of the mind will be different but still it is just the mind Sir, all 21st century universities, any basis of learning, it is all about knowledge. It is about reasonable utilitarian. A child comes to me to do an MBA. Right. I equip him with facts. Right. I make him highly employable. Right. 
I take care of my livelihood by ensuring right. he does his job properly about it right. and reasonable and uh, reasonable and utilitarian you said yes I make it that also right. perception convention of the others yes he learns from my experience learns from your experience and others experience right. now what do I produce something that is saleable in the market or do I pick him up and put him into a meditative state or altogether I don't know one I think this is a question that as teachers we all must pay the greatest importance to. Our friend has said that when a student comes here to do his MBA, hmm? yes, management course, a management course, then he has to be given something utilitarian, something that the market would accept and pay him for. So where does that leave us? We need to open this and explore this. You see, sir, the heat wave this year is more intense than we have seen in many previous years. Hmm? More people have been killed this year then they were killed in the previous 10 years. The number of natural disasters post-1990, hmm? we have just had 21 years, rather 25 years since 1990, but the number of natural disasters in these 25 years exceeds the number of natural disasters in the 100 years before 1990. We all know that the global temperatures have already risen 1.5 to 2 degrees above normal and we know that if this rise hits 4 degrees then it is doomsday. We all know that we are sitting on a stockpile of nuclear weapons that is enough to destroy the earth 10,000 times. Not one, 10,000 times. The same earth can be destroyed once, twice, thrice and 10,000 times over and over again. And the number of countries that have these weapons too is increasing by the day. Not only countries, even non-state actors are on the verge of obtaining these weapons. We are closer to complete annihilation than many of us like to think. Why has man come to this point? There are 9 billion people on the face of earth today. And a proportionate number of species of animals and plants have been wiped out and are being wiped out daily. A child is not born violent. A child is born alright. What brings him to a point where he acts in a way and takes decision that the very existence of mankind is imperiled today? I think you would have seen the drift of my response. It is obviously our education. When you are educating your student only in knowledge and all knowledge is material. When you are educating your student only in knowledge, then obviously he will emerge to take decisions that are just material in nature. What is not material? Love is not material. Nobody can hold love in his hand. What is material can be held in the hand. Joy is not material. Freedom and truth are not material. But our education is all about the material and material only. So, so it is no surprise that the young men that who graduate out of our universities 
do not know love and place the material above the love. The one who does not know love obviously will not care for species of plants and animals and rivers and glaciers. For him, only his own material interests will matter. Even his own interests, he will classify as just the interests of the body because the body is material. He will never know what his heart wants. I am laying out facts in front of you so that you may wonder why mankind has come to this position. There has to be a substantial reason. In fact, those who are predicting doomsday are saying that this, the current one, may actually be the last physically healthy generation on earth. My question to you is, what has brought man's mind to this diseased condition? The child is not born diseased, but by the time he reaches 21 and graduates out of college and university, he is greedy, ambitious and conditioned. Obviously, it has to do with some shortcoming of our education system. And when I say education, I include all the influences that he receives, whether in university or at home or from the media or from his peer group. Between the age of zero, and 21 or 25, there is something surely being fed into his mind that is corrupting the mind. Or there is something very important that needed to go to his mind, but our education is deficient in that and is not providing that. Essentially, you are saying you are being ambitious as corrupted mind? Yes, I am saying that. Any generation, any history, any civilization you can show which is different from as of now. Every that is every civilization, any times you take, you take Mahabharata and others in its end. It was a corrupted mind, wasn't it? How come what was not done in the past million years can change overnight? You see, sir, if my house is burning, will I say that so many other houses have burnt, will I try to take examples from history or if I love my house, I will say that I do not want to look at what has been happening hither and thither. This is my house and I am sure I want to save it. I am talking about what is happening today. Our house is burning. Will we look at the Mahabharat? Our house is burning. We need to save it. These rains are not accidental. They are happening as the result of a diseased heat wave. We are burning. And what is happening is a result of deeply flawed education system. Are we saying at any point did you hear the sage of the Isha Upanishad say that knowledge is to be discarded? Did he say that? In fact, he said that if you worship just spirituality, then you will go into darkness even deeper. It is not a question of discarding knowledge. It is a question 
of our education system being deficient in something yes knowledge we are giving there is no doubt about that and we are giving loads of knowledge it is great that that knowledge is being given but something else that is equally important or probably more important than knowledge that is not being given neither in the schools and colleges nor in the family There are two things in that. First, it is not about values. Because to value something is to give it importance. Values are all man-made. And that, that is the reason why values change from country to country, culture to culture and time to time. Values are a product of human mind. It is not at all about values. It is about something else, far more subtle than values, far more subtle than values. We all want that and the proof of that is that we try getting that in the shape of values. So yes, there is a quest, there is an internal drive to get that. But we are not really getting that, we are missing out something important. See, it is about having two clear wings that enable the mind to fly free. The first is the capacity to observe the world. Observe the world with one's own eyes, not with the eyes of an author. And even one's own eyes must be pure eyes, not conditioned and corrupted. Hmm? Not conditioned and corrupted. So the first is the capacity to observe. And the second is having I'll come to And the second is having a faith within yourself that you can stand and you will be helped even if you are not dependent on the world. The first can be called as attention, the second can be called as faith. First can be called as attention, the second as faith. 